Good morning, everybody. Welcome here. How are you? My name is Jason, and I'm pastor here at The Open Door, and I'm glad you guys could join us. This is something I want to talk about for a while, and I'm really glad to be able to talk about it today with you as we're working through a couple of things in sort of a, a, a vague, broad mini-series, kind of just circulating on, on a few core topics. Now, have you ever, ever, ever been told by somebody to clean your room? Your spouse? Has your spouse ever told you to clean your room? Has your parents ever told you to clean your room? Thea, do you clean your room when your mom asks you to? No. I appreciate that honesty. We've all been told to clean our room, right? Clean your room. Here was my favorite follow-up question, right? Half an hour later, I'm, I'm playing downstairs or outside or something, and my mom comes by and says, So, you done cleaning your room? Yes. If the kid's voice goes up even a half a semitone at the end of that, it's a lie and you know it. It depends on if you're going to check. And then my mom would always say, always, she would always give me the out. She would say, should I check your room? Now here was a deal in our house. If she checked and it failed, there was usually a punishment that came with it. If I at that moment came clean, well I never quite come clean, I would say something like, um, let me check first. And then half an hour later, I'd come back and, yeah, you can check now. That's kind of how that system worked. You, you're all familiar with that little song and dance that parents and kids play, right? Are you sure? I had a similar scenario like that with uh, my daughter, Hannah. I've basically just given up on asking her to clean her room. So that's just my wonderful parenting advice. Just eventually, you just give up. But with her teeth, it's a different story. You see, she's had some teeth problems because she was lactose intolerant while her baby teeth were developing, but we didn't know that. It took us about a year to figure out what the problem was. And so her teeth came in decalcified. And so a, a whole kind of year's worth of baby teeth are, are really damaged. But they're the ones you keep for quite a long time. So I have invested a small car's worth of money into her teeth. Well, thankfully, I got insurance. So I've invested 20% of a small car's, so like four tires and a door worth of a car, into her teeth. So I'm, I'm financially invested in those teeth. And so maybe it was, I think it was Thursday of this week. Can't remember exactly the day. Anyway, getting her ready for school and she was just flying. We were ahead of schedule. And so I said, if you go upstairs, change and brush your teeth, then we actually have time. We can watch a short little video. There's a video that she would wanting to see for a while. And we'd have about 10 minutes bonus time just to cuddle up on the couch in the morning and watch a little video. How ridiculous if you're wondering what the video was. So she runs upstairs and she was pretty excited to watch a little video with me because we never do that on a, on a school morning. And she comes downstairs, and as she's walking down the stairs, I said, did you brush your teeth? Yes. I have a pretty good ear. I detected a semitone rise at the end. So I let her walk all the ways to me, though. I said, okay, can you open your mouth? Well, there's like orange plaque on her teeth. Okay, no, you got to go brush your teeth. So off she goes, and she comes back like three seconds later. She's been in the bathroom for three seconds, and she comes back. And I decide, I'm going to let her walk all the ways back to me, down the stairs and through the living room, all the ways back to me, kill as much time as possible, get there and say, did you brush your teeth? Yes, let's look, you know, do the whole thing. Back a third time. So the third time, she's actually in there for a while, and I can actually hear her brushing her teeth and all that other stuff that you're supposed to be able to hear, right? So anyway, then she comes all the way back, and then I deliver the, the, the coup de grace right at the end. There's no time to watch the video. And, the, you know, the tears start to flow a little bit. You promised! No, I conditionally promised we can watch the video if you hustle now quickly, change and brush your teeth. But it took you three times to brush your teeth. Now we're actually going to have to rush to get you to school. And so we had a little conversation about that, that some of these things are conditional upon you doing your part, right? That there's a, there's a bit of a conversation that has to go on with kids. There are responsibilities you have, and then there are benefits and fun that we can do together as, you know, father and daughter sort of thing. So at the end, I think it was a good learning moment that we had together, except that in that, like, little learning moment, then God did that thing that God sometimes does, and he tapped me on my shoulder you know, just as I feel like, oh, I'm such a good parent. We had a wonderful little learning lesson. You get that little tap on your shoulder, and God's like, so now you know how it feels, hey? <laughs> Nobody asked you, God. I was busy parenting. And so that's kind of where this message comes out of, this idea that there are things in our past, uncleaned up things, undealt with things, unchallenged things in our past, that often 
can stop us, prevent us, can slow us down into receiving present and future blessings that Christ has for us now and later. So there's things in the past that we know about, maybe that he's talked about, that are stopping us from being able to walk in the fullness of what Jesus has and in the blessing of the Holy Spirit for the future. And so I want to talk about that, spend some time unpacking that this morning, and see what we can learn. Because I think all of us, or almost all of us, have had a time in our lives where things with God, things with Christianity have been just powerful. We've had these seasons And if you're not a believer, you've had these things with maybe your parents or in your own life or with a boyfriend or girlfriend or husband and wife or whatever, where it just seemed like you were taking ground, you were kicking butt and taking names and you were dealing with things and there was momentum that was building in your life and there was a season of great blessing in some area of your life. If you, were, uh, if you grew up in a Mennonite home, I don't know about everywhere else, but if you grew up in a Mennonite home, that was every year for one week at camp. Everybody gets resaved and everybody's learning in the secret, in the quiet place. And you're just like loving life and you come home and, and you just feel like you've had preaching every day from wonderful like camp speakers or whatever the thing was and you're like 12 years old and it's like you're just rocking and rolling in your faith. And then you come home and it, if you've had a season like that, you've also had the counter season where it just dies. And suddenly a few months later you're going, what just happened there? Am I, am I the only one who's ever had that experience, the high followed by the low in your walk? You don't have to raise your hands. You can, though. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's good. still happens. So that's the reality. We go through these seasons. If, you, uh, if you're married, you, if you've married for more than three and a half days, <laughs> you had a season where you were pursuing your girlfriend, boyfriend, and it felt like just every time you couldn't wait to call them on the phone or I, I'm old enough, I'm not old, but I'm old enough, you couldn't wait to MSN Messenger, your girlfriend. And it just felt like everything was amazing, and, and you'd have these deep talks, and, and you'd hash through stuff, and there's like difficult things in your life, and then you'd, you'd like be for with each other, or, or maybe you just, you learned how to just spend time together where you were quiet, maybe you're not as chatty as Destiny and myself are, right? And so you just, you learn to sit together and do stuff together, and it felt easy, and it felt fun, and it felt like you were just day by day, hour by hour, walking deeply with this person. And like I said, if you've been married for more than three and a half days, you know, sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes it's just hard and it feels like things just hit a wall and they're they're slow and it feels like you're moving backwards, not forwards. If you've ever dealt with an addiction of any kind, you've had these seasons where it just felt like everything was amazing for a few weeks and it just felt like it was mercilessly hard. And I want to talk about that a little bit. You see, when those things happen, when those cycles happen, when things feel great and you're pressing in, God is always speaking to us. Jesus, through his spirit, is always speaking to us about stuff. And it doesn't always feel related. You know, it's like you're, you're pressing in every time you open up the Bible, like some verse just like means something to you. You know, you know when you read something, it's like it means something to your heart? And you're like, oh, yes, Jesus, I want the thing. I want that blessing. He's like, yeah, I've got more for you, Jason. I've got more for you. I've got more blessing for you. You know, I, I need you to deal with that thing about your finances, though. That's, that's it's important. You've got a bit of a mess going on there. Yeah, I, I'll get to that. I just want more of this blessing, God. I want, I want to see more about, about you know, the authority through your Holy Spirit. He's like, yeah, I've got that for you, too. But, you, you know, I'm, I'm serious. Like, I really need you to deal with some of that financial debt stuff. You've got real pretty messed up in the back there. And yeah, no, I understand that, God. I hear you right loud and clear, but we're learning about spiritual things, and so I want those spiritual things. And, and at some point in time, Jesus sits you right down and says, look, stop, stop. Before we go any further, I'm dead serious. I need you to clean up that financial stuff because if you don't, that's going to sink you in a couple of years. As I raise you from blessing into blessing into blessing, You're going to rise in authority and position and influence. And if you don't stop and deal with that, whatever, I'm making a financial issue, whatever that thing is, that issue in your life, it's going to crush you. It doesn't feel like a big deal now, but it will grow as you grow. See, here's what happens. Some of you might know this if you have an advanced physics background or even maybe grade nine physics. Weight is cubed, strength is squared. So as a, as a building grows, if it grows in perfect exact ratio, its weight will go up to the power of three, but its strength only goes up in any cross section to the power of two. What that means, if you're not following along with me, is if you keep the exact same proportions to a building, eventually its own weight will crush itself. If you build a house, 
like a house, but the size of a high-rise building, the weight of the house will crush itself. So you build it differently with different materials and different engineering. Whew. Everybody just had their mind blown. Now, here's what this means. If you have a tree with some rot in it, it might be just fine. But if that tree doubles or triples in size, and that rot doubles and triples in size, the strength of that tree just went down, and it's now prone to catastrophic failure. So a small rot in a small tree might be a small problem, but a big rot in a big tree is a big problem. So as you grow and develop and step in, there's new areas of your life that suddenly the Holy Spirit is concerned about. Suddenly they're holding you back. And sometimes... Jesus just sits you right down and says, okay, stop. I love you. I love you so much. I need you to deal with what I talked about last time. And in those moments, what we can do is we can get discouraged. We can, like, I can't press in. I can't hear God. I can't feel the Holy Spirit. I read the Bible and it feels dry and it feels dead. And we just give up and this is hopeless and hocus. And maybe I was just, you know, high on some wild energy or whatever back when it meant something. But now that I've grown up, this means nothing and I walk away. Or maybe you fall into the other trap and you go, well, that the old stuff that was being spoken to me, that old stuff now feels dry. That well feels like it's run dry. So I'm going to seek a new word. I'm going to seek a new brand or variation. And I see this with people who church hop, people who small group hop, people who religion hop, and they just go to the next thing and the next thing looking for that hit. But every time they come up against the same wall, and if you don't deal with it, your past struggles can prevent your present blessing. We see this right out throughout the scripture. In fact, I don't want you to turn with me on this one. I don't have it up on the slides. We're not going to go into some of these verses very deeply. I did a rough count. It depends on, you know, exactly which translation you use. But Jesus, walking on this earth, said somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 times, some variation of, have you not heard? Have you not read? Do you have ears that don't hear and eyes that don't see? And then he would finish his sentence. Things like Matthew 19 verse 4. Haven't you read? He replied that he created them in the beginning. Make them male and female. Matthew 12 verse 3. Haven't you read what David did? Matthew 21 16. Have you never read? You've prepared praise from the mouths of children. And on and on and on. Matthew 21, 42, Matthew 22, 31. I can just start quoting. I could probably randomly throw a dart at the Bible. And Jesus was saying, have you not read? Look, I've spoken about this already. You're asking me questions now. You're wanting to move with me now. But I already talked about this. You still have standing orders. Brush your teeth. And your teeth aren't brushed. It's a real thing. Now, we often think of God's word. We think of his laws, of his instructions, both the ones written in the Bible for everybody and things he's spoken to us, either through you know, loving mentors or, or through his Holy Spirit, things he's spoken to us. We often think of these rules or these instructions as, as burdensome, as weights, as like, I want to do what's fun, but like, I know because I love God, I guess I won't do that thing. You know, there's a burden to it. There's a weight to it. Or, or actually, I know plenty of people, and if you grew up in certain church circles in certain time periods and so on, you'll know what I'm talking about, where God's words take on the tone of like a vague threat, like, uh, hey there, Jason, nice life you got there. Be a shame if something were to happen to it. Maybe you want to tithe. Also, there's like this like threatening tone to things that people seem to read into the, the Bible. We read his instructions really brokenly. We look through them from a very broken lens. When actually, I believe, I really do believe this, we were built a certain way to live a certain way. I believe we were created by God to live a certain way. And that he has instructions on how that way is. And that it's actually good for us to live that way. That it is for our own good when he gives us instruction. It's not a burden or a threat. It's actually for our own good. But with that, that means that there are things in our past that can prevent our present blessing. And they might be financial struggles, like I mentioned before. But it could be old hurt that could choke off present blessing. I was talking to somebody not long ago, and, uh, and what he said was, I'm in one of the greatest places I've been in my life. Everything is amazing. I've got great blessing. And suddenly all this old stuff is coming up and I feel very depressed and I'm in a hurt place when everything is the best it could be around me. I'm not surprised. 
You see, when you're in a hurt place, it can be hard to deal with hurt. But as you move into strength, at some point in time, God's going to sit us down and say, okay, look, listen, you're going to have to deal with some of that old hurt stuff. And so he'll bring it up. And that might be a little painful, but it's actually for our own blessing. Maybe there's old forgiveness issues. Yet you're going to have to deal with that before I lead you into strength to strength. Past fear can shake off present blessing. It's not that God isn't trying to bless you, but if you're afraid from things in the past, if you're hurt, if you're wounded, if you've got negative or improper self-image of who you are, either arrogance or, uh, or like a false meekness that's turned into weakness, like, ah, I'm nothing, th- those sorts of things will actually prevent you from walking in present blessing. And so what Jesus is going to do is as he walks with you, he's going to stop you sometimes and say, look, listen, haven't you heard? Don't you remember? I spoke to you about this a while ago. And so when we're in those like amazing places, and maybe some of you are in that amazing place right now where you're just drawing from strength to strength, great, don't stop paying attention to God's still small voice when he asks you to deal with something, walk with him in it. And if you're in a dry place right now, which I really felt and really sensed as I was praying for this, there's a, I mean, that turned out to be the theme of, of this morning, that there's actually a lot of people struggling in a dry place right now. Seeking maybe a new word, maybe losing faith and abandoning God, his love, doubting his love. And I really felt like if you hear nothing this morning, if you hear nothing and take nothing away, ask yourself, when I did feel close to God, what was he last saying to me? Is there a past struggle that's preventing me from living into present blessing? Before you seek something new, is there something old you maybe have to deal with? file properly. We see this lots of times throughout the Bible. I want to pick up on Joshua a little bit. If you want to turn with me to Joshua 23, it'll be like barely a fifth or a sixth of the way into your Bible, book of Joshua 23, right at the end. Joshua's uh, old by the end of his life, oddly enough. Most of us get old by the end of our life. And he's divvied up the promised land. He went in and took a lot of power, a lot of authority over the promised land, led the people, all that sort of thing. But there's still some stuff to do. And so right before he's dying, when he knows his time is short, he starts to issue some instructions for the Israelites for when he's gone. And as he's issuing them, I think it's very important to stop and study what he says as he's looking back at the past, preparing them for the future, where I think most of you are. So Joshua 23, verses 9 to 13, Joshua says, Look, the Lord has driven out great and powerful nations before you. So, talking to you guys, look, God's done great things. He's helped you get over that addiction. He helped you get over that past relationship. He helped you get over that manipulative boss. He helped you get through that financial burden. He helped you by making, you know, it felt real to you and powerful to you back in the past. God's been with you through your life. Look back and remember all that God's done with you. He's helped you with great and powerful nations before. And no one was able to stand against you to this day. In fact, one of you routed a thousand because the Lord your God was fighting for you as he promised. You have a promise that the Lord himself would fight for you and nothing would stand against you. So be very diligent to love the Lord your God for your own well-being. It will go well for you if you do. This is for your benefit. This isn't some vague threat. This isn't some burdensome yoke. This is for your own well-being. So what are those words? What are the things we should do for our own well-being? We carry on in verse 12. For if you turn away, if you turn away from what God's leading you and cling to the rest of these nations remaining around you, you did a good job. You cleared out some of the biggest enemies. You took down Jericho. You've taken huge swaths of land. There's still some cleanup to do though. Be careful because if you cling to the remaining things in your life, if you hold on to them tighter, then you hold on to the promises of God. And if you intermarry or associate with them and they with you, if you bond with the problems and the sins and the issues and the unclean areas of your life, know for certain that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out before you. You will stall. You will not progress. They will become a snare and a trap for you, a scourge for your sides and thorns in your eyes until you disappear from this good land the Lord your God has given you. 
you've done great things with God. But if you lose focus on what he's challenging you to do, you settle down with the issues you've got and say, you know what, I've done a really good job. I'm, I'm leading a small group. I'm praising Jesus. I'm coming to church regularly. I've even started tithing at least 2% That's something. And I'm whatever, whatever your thing is that you think means you've done a good job. And in that moment, Jesus is saying, yeah, but you know the thing is, that business deal you're, you did last year, that was not good. Or whatever that thing is in your life, right? If you just sit down and settle with it and become okay with it, and you don't let Jesus work in that area, at some point in time, he's going to say, you know what? I actually don't want to lead you into new blessing until we've dealt well with this old problem. Until you let me into this area of your life, we're actually just going to stop for a minute. That's what the Israelites did, though. They settled down and they stopped taking ground. They became comfortable with what they had done. And in just a very few generations from Joshua's words, King Solomon was this amazing king who intermarried and associated with the people of these nations they were supposed to uh, dispossess. And he was brought down in, in, uh, in really his, his king and kingdom and in a really terrible way. And in just a few more generations, Israel was completely lawless and without hope. Their present blessing was blocked by their past struggles that they never carried out. God promised them freedom in that area, but they stopped. And when they stopped, God's blessing stopped. And so if you're in a place right now where it feels dry, I really want to challenge you. I want us all to spend some time Sit down and challenge each other. Is there something in the past that's a snare and a trap? Is there something that you need to deal with? A little bit earlier in Joshua, um, the land that already had been taken was supposed to be divvied up amongst the people as their inheritance. In Joshua 18, verses 1 to 3, if you want to turn back just a couple of pages, Joshua 18, verses 1 to 3, it says, The entire Israelite community assembled at Shiloh, where it set up the tent of meeting there. So they gathered it together for a giant conference. The land had been subdued by them, But seven tribes among the Israelites were left who had not divided up their inheritance. God said, go, take over the land, lest it be possessed by wild animals or retaken by by old enemies. Move in power, move in strength. You've got areas you've already conquered. Why won't you go there? But they had stopped. For whatever reason, they had stopped dividing up the inheritance. And so Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you delay going out to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers gave you? How long will you be comfortable with that addiction in your life? How long will you be comfortable and okay and leave alone that deep and disturbing relationship in your life? How long will you sit with your finances in ruin or with your your garbage in your life comfortable? How long when the Lord, your God, has given you power and authority to move in his name, to take control of those areas. You have freedom in those areas. It's been pronounced by Jesus himself that when you move forward, the truth would set you free indeed. This is your land. How long will you sit here and not take the land the Lord your God has given you? How long? Have you not heard? Did you not read these great and wonderful promises? Do you not believe them? Is there old fear, old worry, old hurt? Do you fear losing things that are dear and precious to you? How long will you wait? Oh, people. We read the Bible in sections. Most of our Bibles are nicely annotated. That's wonderful. But they come with little headings. You know, Jesus heals the beggar or, you know, whatever on top of them. And it actually really breaks the flow. And I think sometimes we forget that those weren't written by, like, Luke or Matthew or whatever. They they were put in after the fact to kind of help us organize. And all of the numbers that you see in your Bible were put in afterwards just to help us find things. They're great. Don't get me wrong. They're just things we've added to help organize the Bible. And I find it very useful to forget about them sometimes and actually read, especially the Gospels, like a bit of a linear story, the way it was written by the person who wrote it. So if you want to turn with me to Mark 8, about two-thirds of the way through your Bible, not quite two-thirds of the way through your Bible, is the book of Mark, written by Mark, who is one of the disciples who walked with Jesus, who recorded the life and story of Jesus to us. And Mark is great because he interconnects his stories. We've now boxed them into little packages like they're separate, but he didn't do that. And so I want to quickly browse through uh, Mark 8, 11 to 30. I encourage you to read it through linear on your own time. It starts off with the Pharisees, And they come out and they begin to argue with Jesus. 
And they're demanding a sign. You say you're the Messiah, prove it. Do something amazing. And Jesus is having none of it because it's a bad faith argument. They're, They're trying to egg him on. And he says, look, nothing, no sign will be given to an unrepentant generation other than the sign of Jonah. So then he left them and he, he got on board a boat and again, he went to the other side of, the, of Galilee. And the disciples are great organizers and great communicators, so they had forgotten to take bread because they had thought that they had to eat at some point in time. And they'd only had one loaf with them in the boat. So then he commanded, Jesus tells his disciples, look guys, watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware of unbelief. If you really are the Messiah, prove it. Prove it again. You've done amazing signs. You've raised people from the dead. You've healed blind. Prove it again. We have something. We've seen, we've heard amazing things. We've had the ability to witness these amazing things. But for one reason or another, for the unbelief in the Pharisees' hearts, they weren't able to see it or they weren't able to follow through with it. And so it fell dead before them and they wanted something new because they were walking in unbelief. They were chasing new signs. And Jesus said, that kind of unbelief, watch out for that yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. So the disciples were disgusted among themselves that they did not have any bread. Because they're as dense as we are. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Well, we only have one loaf of bread. So Jesus corrects them. Aware of this, Jesus says to them, why are you discussing that you do not have any bread? Don't you understand or comprehend? Is your heart hardened as well as the Pharisees? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? And do you not remember? I've done stuff in front of you and the Pharisees before. The Pharisees' unbelief and unwillingness to move in power in with me has caused them to become a stumbling block. Are you, disciples, in the same place where you're unable to walk forward with me as well because of the unbelief? Have you not heard? Have you not read? Do you not remember what I've already done? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces of bread did you collect? Well, 12, they told him. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of pieces of bread did you collect? Well, seven, they said. And he said to them, don't you understand yet? Now here, your Bible probably has a break, a pause. And you think, oh, that was a story. The Pharisees argued with him. Then the disciples argued with him. Then Jesus corrected them. I'm going to finish here, but I want you to to get this. This is the same breath. Mark is writing, and he just keeps writing. So just take that line, that heading, out of your mind for a second. Then they came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Notice that Jesus just said, do you have have eyes and not see? And the next breath, Mark goes, and they brought him a blind man. Hmm. So Jesus took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village. Spitting on his eyes. We're going to have some healing later on. I'm just going to have to drink some water, get some saliva built up, and we're going to do some healing later on up front here. Get some mud yet. So spitting on the blind man's eyes and lays his hands on him, he asked, do you see anything? Now this is the question I think some of you need to hear. You've walked in a relationship with Jesus, and he asks you, what do you see? The blind man looked up and said, I see people. They look to me like trees walking. I sort of see this. I've taken some ground. You've done some healing. There's been some work done in me. But if it stops right there, I believe just like the Pharisees, just like the disciples before, that work becomes a dead work in our hearts. Becomes a stumbling block, actually. So what does Jesus say? What's Jesus' answer to all of this? Says, Again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes, and he saw distinctly. He was cured and could see everything clearly. Do you not have eyes? Do you not have ears? But can you not hear and can you not see? Jesus wants us to see distinctly, but to do that, we have to deal with past struggles if we want to live into present blessing. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning. Where is God working in your life? Where is Jesus speaking in your life? Where is the Holy Spirit been moving in your life where you've stopped him? Where you've said, ah, that's fine. I'm good enough. I'd like more blessing over here, but I'm actually fine if you just leave that area alone. That's not a very important area anyways, Jesus. Or where are you walking in unbelief or doubt? Even small seeds of unbelief and doubt. Confusion. Worry. Fear. These are snares and traps that will take you from claiming the promises that God has for you. I want to challenge you this week. It's a very simple challenge. I want you to take some time this week all of us, every last one of us, take some time this week and ask God, 
is there a snare or a trap in my life that you would like me, that you would like me to overcome? Is there a snare or a trap in my life that you would like me to overcome as you lead me into a present blessing? And then, and then, I want you to move boldly in the confidence that Jesus actually does want you to take that present snare and throw it out. Overcome. I'm going to invite the band to come up. Let's get you to bow your heads for a second. Close your eyes. Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, I know you were speaking this morning. I know you were speaking this morning to many of us. We've stalled out, Lord God, and we're sorry. We're sorry, but you're also a God who forgives and you redeem and you long to redeem us, God. And so right now this morning, I ask that you would redeem us in this church. Redeem our hearts. Speak to us. Lord God, clean us, cleanse us. Reveal to us those snares in our lives. Give us the strength, power, and authority to overcome those things. Lord God, that we can walk in confidence into the promises you gave us long ago. Lord God, I pray that we be able to stand and claim on good, solid, old promises and lead us into that power. I pray this in your precious name. And everybody said, amen.